You're listening to the Dibbly Dobbly Podcast. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell to make sure you get the latest episodes of the podcast. Be sure to like and share our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. Hmm. Um, let's move on to our next topic, Neil, and let's talk about the iconic pavilion. And it's one of world cricket's most iconic landmarks. It's the first thing people talk about when they're referring to Lords. And we were just discussing before we started this episode about some cricket grounds around the world not having that connection to their past. As we mentioned before we uh, started this episode, the SCG, the members and lady stand, the Adelaide Oval with scoreboard, Lords obviously with its pavilion, Old Trafford, Trent Bridge, the Oval in England have their pavilions, but not too many cricket grounds still have that connection to the past. Mm. And a lot of the game's great players have walked through that pavilion, through the long room, through the members, onto the ground, through the gates. Um, but Neil, and you'll tell us this in a moment, that the pavilion that we see today is not the original pavilion. It That's is right. the second pavilion. Um, so you'll <clears> tell us a little bit about that in a minute. But so Neil, just tell us the history associated with the pavilion. When it was constructed, what year, who was the architect, and what's inside the pavilion in terms of its artifacts, rooms, etc. The, the current pavilion is actually the third pavilion to, to stand on the ground. Um, it was constructed, the, the, its predecessor was um, dismantled at the end of the 1889 season, and this one was built in time for the 1890 season. So you can imagine how long construction projects take these days. It's, it's a remarkable thing yeah. that such a beautiful and iconic building was, was put up in such a, a short space of time. Um, it was really built to accommodate a growing membership um, at, at the end of the 19th century, MCC mem members, you know, we were acquiring, acquiring more and more members, more and more people wanted to be part of MCC. And the old pavilion, it had been extended many, many times. Um, it was bigger than in its original iteration, but it was far from being adequate to, to serve the needs of a, a new membership. So the club took the, the brave decision to dismantle the old one and, and build this new one. And it, the architect was... Um, Thomas Verity, a man who is um, better known actually as a theatre architect. Uh, a lot of the, the, the main historic theatres in, in the West End of London were, were created by Thomas Verity. Um, and he, he did, he did a, a really wonderful job in, in creating this. It's, it's ironic that he should have used you know, a red brick construction, given that cricket's played with a red ball and it wouldn't be oh. entirely convenient for... Um, you know, batsmen or batters look, looking at, at, at the ball being bolted them from the pavilion end. But there we are. That, that was, that was the, the idiom of the time. Victorian red brick was all the rage in, in London and around the UK. Um, so red brick and terracotta is, is what we got. And, you know, it actually, it's, it's still as beautiful today as the, as the day when it opened. The, um, the heart of it is obviously the long room, which is, probably the most iconic room in, in cricket, if not all of all sports. It's a, it's a double height room um, that, that really has the sense of a cathedral. When, when you're in there um, with a tour group, um, telling them about the history of the place, you, you can hear that same sort of faint echo of your voice that you'd get mm -hmm. in a church. It, it lends itself to um, a kind of reverence, but at the same time, it's one of the few rooms in, in all of sport where professional sportsmen come into real close contact with the, the spectators who are watching them. As I think you yeah. mentioned earlier, the, on, a, on a major match day, a test match, the players are coming down the staircase from their dressing room into this very room, which is absolutely crammed with, with MCC members. And I remember the 2009 test um, when England beat Australia at Lords in a test match for the first time in 75 years. I, you know, there was no one in the library. So I tried to sneak out and get a view of the last few overs. And I, I came into the long room and I was literally creeping my way along the back wall mm. behind members backs. I, you couldn't see a thing. You could yeah. barely move. It was that crowded. Even if people couldn't see, they just wanted to be in there. So on a, on a really significant match day, it's very busy. And Players will always go out with encouragement from the members. They'll get a great round of applause, whoever they're playing for when they come back. Sometimes if they haven't done well, it'll be deadly silence. Um, and I know Ian Botham, when he came back um, mm -hmm. after recording a pair in the 1981 yeah. test, um, just before being 
sacked as, as yeah. England captain, um, he recalled that none of the members would even look him in the eye. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't go down too well with him. Um, but that you can always tell how you've done by um, the reception you get when you come back, and it doesn't really matter whether you're playing for England or playing for the opposition. So it's, yeah. it's a fascinating room that has really two different atmospheres depending on um, what's going on in there. Um, either side of it, we've got the, the committee room, which as you're looking at the pavilion is, is the sort of end room on the left and the writing room is on the right, um, which has kind of traditionally been the quiet room in the pavilion. Um, although we, we do hold events in there, you know, you can get married in the writing room these days. We have all sorts of events going off in the pavilion. But the, the committee room is, is full of history because it's got the um, the list of all the presidents of the club um, framed on the walls. And it's also where a lot of the principal decisions um, in the history of cricket have been made. Mm. You know, think of that famous and very controversial series of cables that bounced back between Australia and, and London during the Bodyline crisis in 1932-33. Yeah. It was in that room where the MCC committee met to consider their response to the Australian suggestion that Douglas Jardine's tactics mm. were unsportsmanlike. That's the sort of occasion, that's the sort of history that, that has lived in that room and you can still get a sense of it when you're in there today. On the floors above, we've got the dressing rooms. Um, those, those are the two main rooms um, on, on the floor above the, um, the, the writing room and committee room. Yeah. And there's just a narrow corridor um, separating them because obviously you've got the top part, the empty void of, of the top of the long room between those two dressing rooms. But those weren't actually the original dressing rooms. If, if you look at the um, very earliest photos of, of the pavilion, there were no balconies on, on those floors. And the, the two dressing rooms were actually directly above um, in what's now the committee dining room where the Queen had lunch um, at Lords for the only time in 2009 on the right uh, as you look at it. And opposite is, is what's now the members bar. And in the 1890s, the Australians were always in that, that visitor's dressing room in what's now the members bar on the top floor of the pavilion. And one of the nicest stories of the pavilion's history for me is actually on that balcony. If you step out onto the balcony um, and look at the terracotta blocks, you can see inscribed the initials or in some cases the full names of some of the Australian players who were touring England in the 1890s and very early 1900s. And, and you'll see the initials VT for Victor Trump, or you'll see the, the full WW Armstrong, um, all, all of that, those great players of the, the golden age of cricket. Um, one wonders how it first got going. Maybe in that, in a test match or match mm. against MCC in 1890, um, perhaps there was a rain break and they were stuck there and bored and they, they started inscribing their graffiti on <laughs> the fabric of yeah. the building. Not yeah. something to encourage, but, you know, they no. did it. It's part of the history. But it's part of history, nonetheless. It is. Lovely. You know, when, when we were examining these um, inscriptions a few years ago, there was one we couldn't identify. There was a gentleman mm. called E. Reeve. Um, and no one seemed to know who he was. But we did a bit of research and we eventually found that in 1903, an E.E. E. Reeves um, played one game at Lords for the um, London Playing Fields Association. Um, he was in that dressing room. He was a wicketkeeper. He didn't take any catches or stumpings. He came out to bat, but he scored naught, not out. It's unclear whether he even faced a ball. He never played a significant game of cricket ever again. But there is his name alongside Victor Trumper, Warwick Armstrong, JJ Lyons, and all the rest of them. Um, it was very soon after that that the dressing rooms were moved and no more graffiti took place. So I, I think the club realised, OK, we'll let the Australian test cricketers get away with this. But when members of the London Federation, or London Playing Fields Association start yeah. doing it, that's a step too far. Yeah. So, um, so that was the end of that story. But the, the inscriptions are still there. We try and preserve them as best we can. Um, and it's one of, one of the most interesting little stories from, from the history of Lords. Absolutely. I, I think um, uh, the SCG dressing rooms um, mm -hmm. do that as well. Overseas players would just sign their name on the, on the doors or whatever like that. Like you see signatures like Sachin Tendorkar or, mm. you know, these great players at the SCG. So a similar, similar thing to what um, 
uh, is happening at Lords for the Pavilion, as you just rightly mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, the honours boards that are at Lords in the Pavilion as well. Um, every mm -hmm. player wants to get their name on the honours board. Um, obviously, Lords decided to have an honours board for one day cricket as well, uh, apart yeah. from test matches. Um, so just tell us about the honours board <coughs> and all that at Lords in the Pavilion. Well, it, interesting bit of trivia. The, the first player to get his name on the honours boards was Wakar Yunus, um, 1992, because before 1992, there were no honours boards at Lords. Yeah. So it was very much a retrospective thing that we did. We, we um, decided to put honours boards up in the dressing rooms to acknowledge great performances in test matches. Um, and we went all the way back to 1884. So I think Alan Steele, the great England cricketer, a batter of the Victorian period, is, is the, the first first one on the board from that test match. Um, they weren't, you know, they, they were pretty cheaply produced, to be quite honest. It was, it was just a, mm. a, a piece of fairly low quality vinyl. We got a guy with a, a, a stencil set to come in and, yeah. and update them every year. Um, and, you know, it was a way of recording great performances, but it didn't really do justice to the atmosphere of the place and, and the significance yeah. of the achievements. So, a few years ago, I think this would probably be in about 2017, 2018, we decided to, to really do the thing in style. So um, we created large new boards of solid oak, nicely dark varnished solid yeah. oak with, with gold leaf lettering, do the thing properly. And they now look properly handsome. Mm. And at the same time, we decided to institute uh, honours as well for one day internationals. And, and there were there were two reasons for this. Firstly, I think it's acknowledged that um, one day cricket has in, in, increased in its prominence in the last few decades. Um, and there are a lot of people who follow the game who are probably more interested in, a, in ODI and T20 cricket than they are in test matches. Yep. Um, so we wanted to acknowledge that there have been some pretty spectacular performances in, in ODI cricket at Lords. You know, you, you think back to... Vivian Richards making 138 yeah. in the World Cup final. Um, Claire Taylor making 156, which is still the highest ODI score at, at, at Lords. Reese Topley last year taking six for 22. Yep. It's been some wonderful performances which wouldn't have found a place on the original honours boards. And the other aspect, of course, is we've not yet had a women's test match at Lords. We've had a few ODIs, mm. which is why we get Claire Taylor and a few others up there. Yeah. But we haven't yet had a women's test match. I hope we will um, in the in the yeah. fairly near future. Um, but it was a way also of acknowledging that there have been some great performances by women cricketers on the ground too since the first ODI took place in 1976. So it, it also it expands. You know, when we've got some um, players increasingly moving towards specialisation in one form of the game or the other, it allows more opportunity for great players who don't necessarily play test matches to to still have their performances acknowledged as well. Yeah, still have that recognition and every time they look at the honours board, they see their name up there and say, well, yeah. quite proud of that effort that I did. And absolutely. Yeah. And one of the nicest traditions that, that has grown up at Lords um, is something the players take care of themselves. You know, if a, if, if a batter's out there scoring 100 and his teammates are back in the dressing room, yeah. by the time that batter comes back off the field, his name or her name will be up on, on the honours board in a um, on a piece of batting tape with yeah. the, the, the final details of mm. their rooms up there. Um, and that's that must be one of the most special experiences. You know you know in your head when you've reached those three figures or taken those five wickets yeah. out on the field of play that your name is going up there. But then to get back in the dressing room and see it's already there, albeit yeah. in a rudimentary form, yeah. kind of shows you, you you've done it, you're there. And also your teammates are valuing the the achievement as much as anybody else's, which is, it must be. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, it's every cricketer's dream uh, to, yeah. to get a especially if it's Australia and England, especially in Ashes century at Lords is even special um, yeah. for many players. Um, um, the pavilion itself, Neil, has it gone any under major redevelopment in terms of restoration, making sure it's in tip-top condition? What's the process behind that? Um there have been a few over the years. I mean, they haven't all sadly been recorded. We had we had a major internal refurbishment back in 2005, um, I think just before the Ashes series that summer. Um, and one of the major changes that, that took place 
um, was actually laying out a, a beautiful roof terrace between the two turrets at the top of the pavilion. Um, yeah. So that that's really provided an extra little facility, which on a on a really nice summer day is, is one of the most beautiful places to watch cricket from. Um, but the I mean, one of the interesting things about the pavilion is is that it it's one of the very few buildings that actually, by the time it opened, it already had an extension that, that wasn't part of the original plans. Mm. What, what's now the bowlers bar um, on the northern yeah. wing of the the pavilion, which is where the, the five minute bell is rung from yeah, yeah. start of play. Um, that was actually designed by Frank Verity as an afterthought. Um, it's gone through a couple of iterations. It's It was redeveloped in the early 1900s, but it was already there in its first form in, in, in 1890 yep. when the building first opened. And for many years, it, it was the dressing room for the professional players. So some of your listeners may be familiar with the social divide that used to exist in English cricket between, yes, between gentlemen amateurs, amateurs and, and, and yep. professional players. And for many, many years, um, right up until the Second World War, they they weren't allowed to change in the same dressing rooms. They had to come out onto the field of play by a different gate. They, they were very much treated as servants. And in fact, mm. MCC for many years actually employed a, a class of servant cricketers known as grand bowlers, some of whom were among the, the, the most prominent um, bowlers. You know, they were usually bowlers rather than batters um, in English cricket at the time. And yet part of their job was, was to, to roll up and bowl at any old MCC member who might fancy a net. Yep. So it was a great way. It was a great way for young cricketers to learn their trade. But for, for some of the older cricketers who were on the staff as professionals, um, you do wonder whether it was the best use of their time. So the bowlers bar was was the, the most obvious architectural evidence of that social divide. Mm. Um, after the Second World War, it's a very different world, and there, there was no longer this requirement for for people to to change in different dressing rooms. Um, yeah. it, it actually changed faster at Lords than at some other grounds. Surprisingly, mm. the, the Oval changed their rules a, a few years after Lords did. Um, but the, the bowlers bar has continued um, as, a, as a separate sort of wing of the pavilion. Yeah. Um, it's now got offices, you know, the, the, the secretary and chief executive of the club, Guy Lavender, his his office is actually on the first floor of that, yeah. that building. Um, he has probably the best view of any office in Lords, huge plate glass window looking out onto the the outfield. I'm surprised he gets any work done on a test match day. It must be yeah. just so distracting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's it's had some different uses since then. It's now known as the Bowlers Bar, and it's 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 quite a small sort of L-shaped bar. Um, very popular with members. Great gathering point. And it's the fact that it's called the Bowlers Bar is is an acknowledgement of that history as as a, a room where the professional bowlers used to get ready for a day's cricket. Absolutely. Um, just something that you mentioned there, the five-minute bell, which is yeah. uh, not an old tradition, but a recent tradition at Lords um, over the years. Tell us about why did the MCC incorporate that into a test match playing day? That That's one of the, I think the, the decision to, to have a, a guest celebrity, usually a former cricketer, um, to come and ring the five-minute bell before a day's test cricket, That that's, a, that's an innovation that's only taken place in, in the 2000s, I think it goes back 15, 20 years, certainly no more than that. Um, but the five minute bell would traditionally have been rung by stewards, um, pavilion stewards to alert the players and officials and the spectators as well that, that play was about to start. Um, I think it goes back, if I remember correctly, to the 1870s. So the, the, the bell, I'm not sure whether it's the original bell, whether it's been replaced, but um, it's, that that tradition predates the pavilion itself and it, it's probably linked again a nice a nice link with thomas garrity the theater designer it's um it's probably taken from the theatrical tradition of a five minute bell before a performance starts to remind all all the, the spectators to take their seats and and make sure they're ready and comfortable yep. and not moving around before the performance starts so that that's that's the origin um, behind the tradition, but it's like many traditions, it's it's one that's evolved and it's now 
a much bigger and more formal part of, of the experience yeah. of a test match day at Lords. It just sets the tone for the day's play. Um, it does, and it's it's always nice when, as as a working member of staff on a test match day, those couple of hours between the gates opening and play starting are probably the busiest of your day um, mm. in terms of a, a, a good chunk of time. And it's very easy to lose track of how close you are to play starting. So just having that yeah. bell, which yeah, sounds pretty clearly, even, even when you're behind the pavilion and there's lots of yeah. people around you, it's, it's good to make you think, oh, crikey, there's some cricket about to start. And yeah. you realise people are going to start moving out of the museum, they're mm. going to start moving out of the library, and they'll be yeah. taking their, their positions ready ready for the first ball. So it, it, it's a valuable part of, of that, that mental process of preparing yourself for a, a day at the cricket, whether you're a player, a spectator, or, yeah. or a member of supporting staff around the ground. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, another question, Neil, about um, the changing rooms. Where do the umpires change where's the dressing room the, the umpires have their own dedicated room which is um it's actually closer to the away dressing room so yeah. if if you're looking from the grace gate towards the um towards the pavilion and you'll see the museum building on on the left and the yeah. pavilion on the right there's there's the little bridge um which connects the two buildings above you and the umpire's room is, is just sort of to the right behind the corner of that bridge. There's the player's dining room, which is on the top floor of the bridge. So that it's a two-story bridge with a, a corridor um, connecting the two buildings. But on the, on the floor above it, it's actually a dining room where the players have their lunch and tea. Yeah. Uh, and just off to the side of that is the umpire's room. So it's sort of tucked away in a kind of forgotten corner of the pavilion that not many people yeah. visit. In fact, I, well, I don't think I've ever been in there myself. <laughs> it's <a long laughs> well, I, I think that's everyone's um, probably um, thing about umpires that, uh, you know, oh, you know, they make dodgy decisions or bad decisions. So we'll just give them a tiny room in the corner and not a big room like the players. But uh, going back to the bell point that you made, mm. uh, Keith Bradshaw, the late Keith Bradshaw, who worked at MCC, sadly passed away, yeah. um, was working at Adelaide Oval. He brought the five-minute bill tradition to Adelaide Oval, which is happening yeah. at the moment. Yes, um, I mean, it would have been, I can't remember whether it was just after Keith had started or just before he started as, as Secretary and Chief Executive at Lords that the this, this sort of celebrity bell ringer idea mm. came in. It might have been Roger Knight, who was his predecessor, who instituted that towards the end of his time. Um, but yeah, Keith, Keith was a well-loved presence around Lords. He was very popular with the staff. He was always friendly. He was a bundle of energy. He was already always very positive mm. about ideas that were pitched to him. Um, you know, we, we all understood when he, he felt the need to go back to Australia for, for health and yeah. family reasons. Um, um, but we kept in close touch with him. And it was, you know, I was, I was friends with him on Facebook as well. So it yeah. was, it was a sad, sad time. We knew, we knew he'd been ill fighting tremendously hard against this terrible illness for a number of years. Um, so we weren't surprised in the end to hear of his, his passing, but it was it was a sad, sad day for everyone at MCC who remembered him so fondly. Yeah, and, and also at the SACA as well in South Australian cricket, definitely, and definitely. as well being head of um, cricket there, um, bringing in the five-minute bill. It's a nice touch at the Adelaide Oval. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a bit different to Lords. Obviously, you have to climb up a set of stairs to uh, mm. ring the bell because um, it's raised a little bit uh, next to the uh, viewing rooms at the Adelaide Oval. Um just to one side in the uh, Sir Donald Bradman Pavilion. Uh, but I'll, tell a nice story. I'll tell a nice story about Keith, if I may. Um, yeah, when, absolutely. When we first yeah. joined MCC, we were, we were well on the way of, of organising a major um, exhibition tour of the Ashes Urn to coincide with the 2006-2007 series. Yes. And we, we got the whole schedule worked out. It was going to all the state capitals where, um, where the, the test matches were being played. Um, it was also, so it was going into the, the state museums, but also into the museum at the MCG. Yeah. Um, Keith comes on, on board as secretary, proud Tasmanian, of course, and says, hang on, where's Hobart in this? <laughs> so very quickly, a couple of weeks um, in Hobart were tagged on to the end of, wow. of, of this schedule. Um, really huge logistical exercise to do this. Yeah. Um, 
but it was a great thing because so many people came. I think more than 15,000 people came to see mm. it in, in, in Hobart. Um, Tasmanians really took it to their heart and it was it was a great way to end the exhibition tour that, that everyone was really gr glad they did in the end. It was thanks to Keith that it happened. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great story you shared there. Um, just one question, last question before we move on to our next topic, Neil. Um, I've noticed on the pavilion weird looking faces that look like gargoyles on yeah. the pavilion. When you, yeah, tell us about that origin. Why was that included in the design of the pavilion? There's no explanation of why that was included um, in in the, any of the paperwork we have relating to the, the mm. pavilion's construction, which is is limited. I have I have to say, yeah. um, we've not even been able to identify them all. We we've we've got two of them. We think they are Lord Harris, who was one of the the great figures at Lords towards the end of the. 19th century and, and through the early 20th century. He was um, the, also the leading man in Kent cricket, but he was a, a president and trustee of MCC, um, many, many years involved in the club, uh, and, and one of the most powerful figures uh, at Lords. Also um, responsible for a lot of overseas tours. So he, he was one of the figures who inspired that kind of missionary work that MCC did with, with overseas tours in the early 20th century. And the other one, Spencer Ponsonby Fane, um, who was, you know, he'd been a member for a long, long time by the 1890s. And in, in the 1860s, um, he was he was the man who first started collecting artworks and memorabilia for the MCC collection. So everything we have in the museum, library and archive, through to the fine art that hangs on the walls of the pavilion, it's really thanks to Spencer Ponsonby Fane's initiatives. Um, that, that we have that wonderful collection that allows us to tell us tell the history of Lords and, and of cricket in general. But apart from those two, um, we've never been able to identify any of the others, despite the best efforts of um, of you know, some of the most prominent historians in, yeah. in cricket. It's it's very difficult. We think they were they were probably trustees or com committee members at the time, but we've never yeah. been able to establish a, a positive identification. So it's one of those wonderful little mysteries. Yes, that, um, that adds, something that a touch people of... may not be aware of as well, because when you, when the camera zooms up to the balcony, you can see one of them there. Uh, where yeah. are they located? It's mainly the facade, the front, or it's it's all on the, all on the front. Yeah, they're they yeah. all they all face the, the the pitch. So I guess um, in a, a bit in the way that when when you look at a cathedral, yeah, gar gargoyles and and, yeah, and yeah. other sort of decorative features are, are facing yeah the person coming in towards the entrance so that they have the most impact. Yeah, well, quite a very uh, little unique feature of the pavilion. Mm. Um, for our listeners or people who are watching, um, if you have a photo of the pavilion in front of you, just zoom up and you'll see one of those gargoyles in the uh, bricks Absolutely. of the pavilion. Just, just Google, Google it. You'll find lots of yeah. pictures of the pavilion all over the internet. You know, people people on the Lord's Tour will take them from loads of different angles yeah. and post them online. So you'll, you'll find, you'll find, I'm sure you'll find plenty of um plenty of uh, images to look at. And if anyone thinks they can identify any of the other faces, please let us know. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Hope you enjoyed part two of our historical series episode, looking back at the history of Lord's Cricket Ground and the MCC with Head of Heritage and Collections, Neil Robinson. I hope you enjoyed listening to Neil and I talk about the pavilion at Lord's Cricket Ground. Stay tuned for part three of our historical series episode, looking back at the history of Lord's Cricket Ground and the MCC with Head of Heritage and Collections, Neil Robinson.